Got any questions on this torsion stuff so far? Well, we uh, finish this thing up. If there aren't questions, all right. So what we got going on here? We got this motor. It's turning the shaft. Um, shaft spins at 1750 RPM. We want to find the angles, uh, point C and point C with respect to B. So what we've got there for the angle, what we mean is if we've got a point up here in the unloaded condition, when you start spinning it, um, what's going to happen here is that, you know, we could call this um, <coughs> The old term when you're tuning up a car, you call that top dead center. What's going to happen is that's going to just bend back a little bit because of the load being applied to the uh, to the shaft. So on the cross section there, you'll have a little bit of twist. That's the twist angle phi, okay? And and that's just on account of that torsional load applied to the shaft. So we want to find these angles that are occurring. We're, we're going to use A as the uh, reference point, and then we'll kind of work our way through from there. So think of a kind of a line uh, drawn across the top of the shaft before any loads are applied. And then just think what happens to this line after the loads are, going to, are applied. It'll, it'll bend a little bit, okay? So when we look at that on the cross section, what that is is the twist angle, right? So if we did that, you know, what's going to happen here would be something like that. So if you have initially a line drawn on the cross section, you know, straight up, it, it would bend a bit. And so that would come down like that. So what's alpha here? What, what's that and what's beta? What are these different angles? What's alpha and what's beta? If we're just going to call them out with uh, common sense words that are maybe strengths terms that call them for what they are. What, what are they? Yeah, alpha is the strain, okay, shear strain. That's what that is, okay. And beta is the, the twist angle or angle of twist or whatever you want to call it, okay. So even though they're caused by the same phenomena or whatever you want to call it, you know, the same thing that's happening for the torsion, they're, they're different things because they're measured in different places, okay. So, you know, that those are the, the kind of the, what, what those things are, okay? Right. So if we want to measure those, if we want to get that twist angle, which is phi, that's what this is. It's TL over IG. We put a P subscript on the I because it's polar. It's a polar moment of inertia, all right? And that's analogous to the PL over AE that we use when we do axial deformation, or if we do shear deformation, when it's VL over AG. <coughs> it's the same formula applied to these different situations, basically. Okay. All right, so what we got to do here is collect that information, T, L, I, and G. Okay, and I calculated I right there. That's in the middle of your page. Um, the length is pretty obvious. It's just right there on the shafts. So you need G, and that's given. That's the shear modulus. And then you got to find T. Right? So what we're finding here is the twist, you know, how B twists back with respect to A. And then we want to find how C twists back with respect to A. So we do it in steps. We find the twist of B with respect to A. But then when we go from B to C, <coughs> we've got a whole new loading and a whole new everything, a whole new cross-section, whole new length and all that. 
So we got to do C with respect to B. Okay, so each time we get a change in load or cross section or G or something like that, we've got to redo it and then add those kind of intermediate steps together to get the total. That's kind of how this works, okay? So what you want to do is you want to find the internal torsion. And there's two ways to do that. One way is a more formal way. And what you do then is you find the reactive torsion, which is usually at your reference point, which is A. Okay. So what I'm doing there is I'm going TA plus 120 plus 80. Those are the applied torsions equals zero. Solving for TA, it's minus 200. So there's the reactive torsion right there. Then I start working out from the reactive torsion and I make a cut through whatever internal torsion I, I want to find. So if I want to know the torsion between A and B, I make a cut between A and B, turn it into a free body diagram. And then I put that internal TAB on the sketch and take everything in this case to the left. Write that up negative 2,000 because by the right hand rule if I twist my right fingers in the direction of the arrow my thumb will point in you know, towards A basically there okay then plus TAB solve for two, TAB it's positive 200 so these things act opposite directions this one's negative that one's positive okay that's just right hand rule stuff okay now, I could also have done that just by adding these two effects together, 80 and 120 positive, get me 200 positive. I could do it that way, too. A um, little less formal approach, so to speak. Okay. And then I can do the same thing and get the internal torsion in BC. Same deal. I, I cut through BC. I take it, <coughs> everything to the left, which is where my reference point is. I got 200 at A, negative, positive 120 at B, so that when I do the equilibrium, I get 80 at, in between B and C. Okay. All right. And also, of course, that equals that applied torsion at C. Right. So what I've just found there are the internal torsions. Anywhere between A and B, it's uh, positive 200. Anywhere between B and C, it's positive 80. All right. And then I got that information, I can put it into a table, TL over IG. So I just put a row in for each one of those things. I put the units over there on the left, so I don't have to be putting them in every place in the table. So Newton meters for T, meters for length, meters to the 4 for I, meters per meter squared for G. Plug everything in there. I've got everything in standard units, Newtons and meters, run the numbers, and I get a unitless number, which is a radian angle for AB. So that's the twist of B with respect to A. You could also just call it the twist from A to B. You can call it, you know, either name seems to be used. Okay. If you're going to do BA, you put a slash between. For those of you that had dynamics, you know, that means with respect to. So it's B with respect to A. If you remember relative motion when we did that, we used that notation. Okay. So that's 0 .07, 01797 radians. So that's how much B twists with respect to A. Okay. It's positive, so it's in the positive direction. Are we okay with that? Okay. We can do it again for BC plus 80 for the internal torsion. 0.5 meter length, 2, 0.251 times 10 to the minus 6 for I, 7 times 10 to the 9 for G. Plug it in, and I get positive 0 0.02274 radians. Okay. So each point there is twisting a little bit with respect to the other. So I've got how B twists with respect to A, that's the 01797. And then I got how C twists with respect to B, that's 0.02274. So if I want to find the net twist of C back with, with respect to the reference at A, I just add those two effects together. 
and that comes out to be 0 0.04071 radians, which is 2.33 degrees. Okay. So from A to C, that thing, that shaft's going to twist a bit, 2.33 degrees, on account of the loading we're putting on it. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, if you're making machinery, you know, you, this is a drive shaft. You know, it just depends on, on what you're doing. It may not make any difference at all, but, but it might make difference. I mean, it might be a problem if you've got some sort of mechanical timing going on in there where valves are coming up and they have to come up at the exact moment something else is happening. This could cause a problem if things start to twist too much. Okay. So I have just a little bit of a, a little further analysis there. If we know the, the um, RPM on the shaft, we could figure out how much of a lag there is at C. For it for that point to come up to a reference point, we'll use top dead center, which is exactly 12 o'clock. Okay. All right. So if that's the case, um, and we've got 750 revolutions per minute, so that's 183.3 radians per second. Okay. And then we got 0.02274 radians difference between B and C. It's not going to be much, but it's going to be lagging, you know, the 0.02274 radians. Also, if we look at it in a sense of time, it'll be 0.000124 seconds. So it's going to be late by 0.000124, basically. Okay. You know, who knows what you know, I'm not saying we're doing anything specifically here, and I don't know how to evaluate that, but that's just what's going on with that. It's not coming up to the top quite at the time you would expect if it were, you know, if you designed it unloaded, it would be a little late. Okay. Any questions on that? You all okay with what we're doing there? Okay. All right, so uh, so that's that one. Six eleven. Um, why don't you just find the applied torsions at? Uh, how about just? We don't need to overkill this. How about just at E? What's the torsion at E? If you hang a mass on an armature like that, on that shaft, what torsion will it create at E? Why don't you see if you can figure that out? So this is 611. We're just going to just do one little bit of this. So what torsion is induced there at, at E on account of that mass hanging out from the side? Okay, right there. How would you evaluate that when we work on that? Just for a second.
it might be a handier sketch to kind of analyze it with. Because what a torsion is, it's a moment about the center of a shaft. Okay. So, you know, it's, a, it's kind of an isometric sketch. So if you look at it from the front, it's really the view you want to get this thing worked out. So you're looking at it that way. So you just need to get that mass turned into a weight. And then uh, multiply that by the offset distance, really. What's the sign on that one going to be at E? Yeah, it's negative, because that's going to come around that way. You curl your right fingers that way, your thumb points in towards A, so that's negative, OK? And as you're looking at it, it's the same sort of deal as a moment, any kind of moment. See, that's, uh, no, it's not, it's negative there, okay? So there we go. Clockwise, negative, as you look at it. Okay. Everybody good with that? Is this the basic idea of where a moment comes from? Or a, a torsion, which is a moment about the center of a shaft? Not about the supported A or anything like that. It's about the middle of the shaft. Okay. So negative 7358. Any, any questions there? This is kind of basic. Basic deal there, looking at it. All right. All right. You know, I've dealt with pumps a little bit, and you know, if you look inside a pump, you've got an impeller, which is kind of a spiral-shaped deal. Um, impellers look something <laughs> like that, and they spin, and they throw water out is what they do. So the water usually comes in through the middle of the uh, volute, as it's called, which is the case where the impeller is, and the impeller spins and throws the water out the other side, um, quite often up. That's usually what you're trying to do with a pump. So you're talking something like that. So the load, you can see the load that's being exerted as the as the impeller works its way around and throws that water. You can see where that how that torsion's generated, okay, in the shaft. And you can kind of work your, you know, work with that a little bit. There's an example of. A practical situation that you might run into. Also, if you've got like a some sort of manufacturing deal where you've got a motor and a shaft and pulleys coming off of the motor, you know that's exerting the torsions on there. Okay. How did you, how did you describe the difference between how you use the word torsion and torque? Totally random. <laughs> I, got, I got nothing on that. I don't. I don't really use it very scientifically. So yeah. there's so many words that describe this torsion. Uh, there probably is a difference. I mean, the official word is torsion, which is the moment about the center of something, you know, the long axis, the center of something, like you're twisting something up, like a bolt or a, a torque. You got a torque wrench, right? I kind of use them interchangeably, so I don't, I don't really know. There's, there might be some fine difference in the definition, but I don't know. Okay. Um, All right, let's do a little biaxial stuff with this. You know, um, you know, I was mentioning this again when we were doing the biaxial stuff that we'll come up with uh, design equations to get us into these plane elements that have biaxial stress on them. So here's another example here. Um, now, if you, I mentioned earlier that torsion is very much a function of, uh, of shear. You know, shear and torsion go together. I was looking at an element inside the cross section of a shaft earlier when I derived everything, you know, did that little derivation for you. We're looking more at an element like that. But now let's look at an element on the side of a shaft, okay? And if you just kind of look at that, 
here this torsion's coming up this way, this one's going down. See, those translate directly into shears like that in the same direction on that element that I've got drawn on the surface of the shaft. So the one on the right-hand side is up, the one on the left-hand side is down. And they both have the same sign there, which is positive, okay? So the torsion relates directly to the shear. And the equation is what tau is TR over I. That's, that's the shear that's occurring on that element, okay? And what that is is actually tau XY. That's the, you know, the shear on the X plane. Now, if that were all that was going on, that, that thing would start to spin counterclockwise. So as a result of that, you got shears counteracting on the other two planes going the other direction, negative, clockwise. And that's tau y x on those planes. So you end up with an element like this. Now, sigma x and sigma y are zero. There's no direct normal stress induced on these x, y planes, okay? So when you want to draw up a little biaxial element, you know, just have a look at the torsions and which way they act, whether they are rolling the shaft up or down, and just translate that directly to shears, okay? And then the other two shears on the uh, Y planes there, the horizontal planes that go the opposite direction, okay? And, and the magnitude of tau XY is just that shear formula we've developed, TR over I. All right. From there, you, and now, and then sigma x and y are zero. There's no normal stresses on the xy planes anyway. Okay. okay, from there you can get into the biaxial stuff, and there's the biaxial equations, but the thing is that sigma x and y are zero, so that makes an awful lot of stuff just cancel out. So they tend to have these special biaxial equations just for torsion because they're just so much simpler than the full-blown biaxials because sigma x and y are zero. So sigma x1 is just tau xy sine 2 theta. Tau x1 y1 is just uh, tau xy cosine 2 theta. That's it, okay? So they're just the biaxial formulas. Just a lot of all the normal stress stuff is zeroed out. And it's on the back on your formula sheet in the torsion section, these two formulas. Because, okay, uh, you know, there, there's so much stuff that zeroes out of the full biaxial equation that they're, they, you know, they're, they're simpler, so they're kind of listed as separate equations, even though they derive directly from the biaxial equations. Right. All right, now, if you fabricate a shaft by taking a plate and kind of wrapping it on a cylinder, you'll have a seam. So this is one reason why you might want to look at biaxial stresses. You don't have normal stress on the XY planes, but you do have normal stress at angles. So you might be interested what was going on, you know, what, what, what's going on with this thing, okay? On that one seam where you fabricated the shaft. This is a reason why you might want to find these biaxial stresses at an angle. All right, so to find tau max and sigma max, of course, this is what you often want to know. Um, tau x1, y1 um, is tau xy cosine 2 theta. Well, that maximizes, as you might expect, right on the xy planes. Tau max is just plus or minus tau xy. Okay. And again, that's just T, the torsion, times the radius divided by the moment of inertia. That'll get you the maximum shear in the element. Now, the normal stress is tau xy sine 2 theta. So to maximize that, you want to maximize the trig function here, which is sine 2 theta. Well, sine of 90 is, and sine of 270. Those are the maximums. Sine of 90 is 1. Sine of 270 is negative 1. So the two thetas are 90 and 270, so the thetas are 45 and 135. So the maximum normal stresses uh, occur at 45 degrees. Okay. So sigma max is plus or minus tau xy. 
again. So sigma max is equal to plus or minus tau xy. And again, that's equal to tr over i. So when you do that tr over i, you have the maximum shear stress in the shaft, and you also have the maximum normal stress in the shaft. Okay. So that's the biaxial stuff, okay? So are we good with that? We got any questions on that? Let's have a look at some failure modes here when we consider where those maximum stresses act. If you have a mild steel, that's commonly used for structural stuff. If mild steel has a low carbon content, so it's ductile. It stretches a bit. So if you have a ductile material like a mild steel and you apply torsion to it, how do you think that's going to fail? Shear. Yeah, it's going to be a shear failure, right? So what plane will it fail on if it fails? If I apply a torsion like that, what's it going to do? And if you're thinking it's kind of common sense, why is this one going to be rocket right? science? 40 degrees? That's the normal stress. What's it, what happens if I turn it? Just... 90. Yeah, 90. Yeah. <laughs> Theoretically amazing here. If I twist it, it'll just break, right? You know, it didn't break too well, but you know. Um, so if you just twist that thing, it just shears across at 90, right? Like that. Okay, so that's a shear failure. So what's going on? We're doing that, we're doing that. Okay. So there's a lot more going on than you know than you knew before you took this class, right? We we got this element here, we got that coming down, we got shear going on here. It meets in the corner, meets in the corner, and it's just sh shear failure right there. Thing. Pretty simple, okay? How about a brittle granular material? Cast iron, concrete, pretzels, styrofoam, stuff like that. I forgot to bring pretzels, I'm sorry. I meant to. All right, so if I load it like that, what, what, what mode will that, will a brittle granular material fail in? Shear? Yeah. Yeah, tension maybe. I don't know. Sure, tension. Okay. Tell me which way that tension would act on this thing if it's tensile failure. Kind of put the steps together. Build the shear element first. What does that look like? As I have it drawn. Um, on on the tau x y, is it positive or negative on this? Yeah, because the shears are going to do that. The shears just track the applied torsions. You all good with that? You all seeing that? Okay. Then the other two shears meet in the middle, or meet at meet in the corners. I'm sorry. All right. Now, if I want to draw up the normal, is everybody good with that? Any any questions on what I just did there and why and all that? You all seeing that okay? Sometimes you can draw a diamond inside an element like that. See these two like that? If I add those up like vectors, the net resultant vector would do that, wouldn't it? You all with me there? One left, one down. The net result would be down left at 45, pushing on that face. Here's how I'm doing this visually, so I don't have to run through all the calculations, so I can just see this, okay? Um, how about the other two? What are they going to do? These two. On the nearest face, they're going to do that. Okay, good. So 
So I've used green and light blue. I'm going to go orange next here. Now you can take any two you want. What, what if I add these two that I just drew, the third, or this one, and that one? Add them like vectors, which way would they act? Good. Put it on the nearest face. And then the last two. Oh my god, I got I've used red, blue, green. So I have to go with purple. Yeah. How about those two? What are they gonna do? Okay, you good? So see the tensile acting at that particular angle? All right. So if I take a piece of styrofoam, now this is kind of, I used to be able to get good styrofoam. This stuff's a little, got a little bit of tense kind of uh, ductility to it. It doesn't quite work as well as I'd like. Uh, but if, so if I just twist that, if I roll my top hand over, see, pretty close to 45. So why, will, why, why does this uh, brittle material do that? Well, what's happening is you're applying a bunch of simultaneous loads when you apply this stress, okay? So you're applying shear, tension, and compression. So it's going to break where it's weakest first. As I ramp up and turn my wrist, those stresses think like a graph. They're all going up. And whenever one hits its limit first, that's where the failure occurs. And, and this granular material with, with the grains, you don't lap much. And you don't get much tensile strength. When you pull apart grains, they, they come apart pretty easily. So this is weak in tension. Okay. Now the other one is just shear. I mean, that one slid. That's kind of the primary stress you're applying. So, you know, that, it has no shear strength clay. So it just went. Okay. All right. So that works with pretzels too. Okay. And there's even a, see that... Uh, on the left, no, on the right, I'm sorry, you're right. I've even heard of bone fractures like that. They're called spiral fractures. When you kind of like, if you get, uh, that happened to one of my daughter's soccer teammates. She put her foot in the hole and the field wasn't too good and kind of torqued her shin around. It wasn't real pleasant, yeah. So it's like that. Thought she sprained her ankle. Thought she could stay in the game. It was pretty tough, but no, she, she, she couldn't stay in the game. She had to get out. Okay. So there you go. All right. One more. Thin-walled tube. What don't thin-walled tubes like so much? What's that? Yeah, twisting. I guess they don't like a lot of things. I don't know if they like anything. Yeah, it's a little yeah. Okay. Good there. The other two meet in the corners. And then, you know, you can draw a 45 degree element off to the side if you want. Sometimes I just like to do this because I can see them easier. Those two go out. These two come in. Good. So what thin walled, what, what doesn't a thin walled thing like if something's thin? What, what doesn't it handle very well? Yeah, compressive, a little buckle is the term for it. So if you got something thin and you apply a compressive load to it, it'll, it'll bow. The material itself won't fail, but the, but the object will bow, okay? Bow out, it's called buckling. All right. So I'll roll that over the top. Mm -hmm. 45 degrees or thereabouts, get a little bit of uneven effects from the you know, the caps there on the end of the shaft. Okay. okay with that, see how that lines up with that compression was compression error? Okay. So there you go. So we had compression coming in like that. And it buckled the the wall. So those are some failures there, okay.
All right. So, you know, that's something you want to keep in mind, you know, when, you, when you're doing shafts. The, the type of failure will depend on the type of material. And if we want to run through some mathematics on this, on 6.30, we've got some stuff here um, that we could do, some calculations. So what we want to do is find the maximum stresses that act on this thing and the direction they act. And we also want to uh, sketch up those elements. So that little rectangle down there, why don't you put the arrows on that that represent how the shears would act on that, the square element. Over there, you got one on the right. Let's put the shears on that. Well, we start with that. And then what is the shear? I mean, how do we calculate that up? calculated I for you. So to find that uh, shear, it's just the general shear formula. That's the maximum shear that acts in the element. That's all you got to do with that. Okay. You all doing okay with that? Shear's looking like that, and the magnitude's just TR over I. Got any questions on that with the direction and whatnot? Okay.
Want to do a couple there too? You wanted to? For Winston? Get a quick look at 281 and 2. We got this in a minute. Let's just make sure I got those numbers right. There should be a couple of biaxial problems here with the table. Great. Yeah, 281 and 2. Okay. 